difference to do with um, what uh, should volunteers be professionally accredited um, and what does it do to assist us in that kind of thing. Um, so our main thing was that um, we should uh, have something to offer for those who would like to be professionally accredited but not sort of force people into accredited <coughs> where they don't want to be when they more of a, have more of an interest um, in archaeology and, and don't want to necessarily put that down. Um, and um, the main um, issue is the capacity side of things. Um, the capacity of companies and local authorities to manage the processes and, and using volunteers. Um, and uh, it seems that most people are still happy that if they meet the minimum standards, um, there's, there's still value there uh, to the projects and, and the AGR. Um, and then we looked at, um, in, uh, does CEFA do enough to encourage the, the membership of, of volunteers? Um, and um, we noted down that there are, there are various things they can use uh, in the Bachelor of Skills Pass Force and um, CEFA are developing pathways to help people get to practitioner range. Um, but also, there should be a link up um, in the sense of CEPA um, and whether that's more appropriate for some people um, to, to go down that route so they're not implementing yields. Um, and then we also talked quickly about um, the barriers in the language um, and um, how accessible it is to apply. Um, and it seems that um, professionals have, have trouble with the competence matrix themselves, so if they're having problems, then that, that wouldn't help the volunteers at all. Um, so we're thinking of uh, we perhaps need to look at the application process and how we can make that more accessible. And also the language of that environment, so making that more accessible to, to people who aren't necessarily used to working with those, uh, those sorts of words and things. Um, and, um, and then, uh, sorry, I lost my train. Um, and then um, the last thing we said was that CIFA and CDA can't exist in isolation, and there have to be a partnership between them, um, and, the, and this needs to be transparent to avoid any issues between the volunteers and the professionals. And all working together. Um, and finally, um, the, is there a role for the voluntary and community special interest group? We think that this um, is an important group and should be reinvigorated so that um, they can cover and discuss all these kinds of things um, to, to help move it forward. Right, so we looked at um, the similar themes um, and lots of overlap, obviously. Um, should volunteers be accredited or affiliated? Um, really interesting discussion around that from some volunteers sitting with us at the table. Are volunteers interested in the academic side of things? Informal feedback was potentially um, no. There was some interesting feedback offered on experiences of covering the NVQs um, and that there was quite a lot of negative feedback actually from professionals within the sector about that and volunteers undertaking those. But there was agreement that some form of qualification should be useful if geared towards field archaeology. Um, there was also discussion around attitudes towards volunteers are incredibly mixed within professional archaeology. So, um, lots of discussion um, and that we agreed that actually accreditation or affiliation should be an indication towards someone's skill set. And using the example of a volunteer with 20 or 30 years experience um, is not considered a professional in inverted commas as opposed to somebody who's straight out of university perhaps considered as a professional archaeologist but with no field skills. One of the greatest challenges finally on that first question was um, around health and safety and CSCS card, even that volunteers can be overcome. There was a feeling that volunteers should create extra value and not replace a core need. Second question, does CIFA do enough to encourage volunteers? What can they get out of um, membership? Um, they felt, and uh, we all discussed and agreed that um, CIFA and CBA are fantastic at offering network opportunities such as this event, um, both locally and nationally. It was really important to get together and share ideas for new projects, to meet people, um, and that at that level, affiliate membership was appropriate for volunteers. But the point was made that um, the volunteers themselves felt that CIFA itself um, does no advocacy in terms of what it offers to volunteers, so more opportunities should be discussed there. Third question about barriers in languages, um, barriers in language for professionalism and accreditation. Um, there was a great discussion about the fact that archaeology can be a great leveller, 
and that if you're on a dig um, and somebody walking a dog walks past, you can have a conversation with them with no prior knowledge of archaeology. And that itself is a fantastic opportunity to infuse and inspire all types of people uh, from all different backgrounds. That we also agree that jargon was um, present in all professions, and it's often about the individuals who are talking to groups of volunteers and how they um, address those and how they make that relevant, um, rather than um, it being a barrier within itself. Um, and then finally, um, is there a role for uh, <coughs> community volunteer special interest group in CIFA? Absolutely, definitely. Groups, professionals, volunteers all need to talk to each other. Um, we reference the local heritage engagement network um, with uh, CBA um, and the need for advocacy. Um, and interestingly, like this last group you discussed, capacity in another issue, we felt that actually there was a gap in supporting community archaeology groups and roles and who should take that on within the professional sector and that that was a capacity gap. Thank you. Okay, so our remit was to discuss embedding community, the community and developer-led archaeological investigation. We had a very um, busy and uh, full discussion of that. But the sort of points we want to feed back are, firstly and foremost, we felt that it was important to reiterate that there is a policy framework for security, securing public benefit through the MPPX and the associated guidance that goes with it, i.e. that we, um, you know, and in, in, in it's a responsibility on all sectors who are delivering the sort of larger components of the, um, and the MPPX to, to promote and to recognise that and to build that early on into their, their project so that public benefit should be seen as a sort of intrinsic part of sustainable de development. And we recognise the role very much of curators who, and, and that they were very much under, under stress to um, advise on this process from early negotiations through to advising on conditions and writing briefs. And we thought the, you know, the curatorial process is absolutely crucial in, in, in realising this public benefit because without that it won't, it won't happen. But at the same time we recognise that the pressures of commercial archaeology as it's currently constituted do not um, make delivering community archaeology, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that is factored out largely on, on cost grounds. So we need to, first of all, secure the planning system, but also be creative in how we um, seek partnerships with other organisations. We thought the Greater Manchester examples were very good, where there was obviously a partnership between the, the curatorial service, the um, community archaeology groups, and the university, in securing um, research, local research um, projects above and beyond the requirement of filling the planning condition, but that actually the, the contribution to archaeological knowledge arising through the, um, through the planning condition might then lead on to further research and, and, and create sort of sustainable groups who can, can, can further that work. Uh, we touched on many of the similar points talking about maximising public benefit in development of archaeology as the last group. Uh, we had an interesting discussion about who were, who were the public and then trying to identify the various <coughs> different groups because you immediately think it's something we do to other people as archaeologists. Um, and so we covered a range of issues that it wasn't just the public who you might be developing uh, next door to them, but also it was the professionals who maybe get some sort of added value from engaging with the public and having that exchange, and also the developers who suddenly understand what archaeology is all about and they get the community to perhaps understand their project <coughs> better. Um, and we also talked about the transferable skills, so not necessarily when volunteers come onto site is it that they know how to identify salient, but also it's the communication skills, the uh, planning skills, and they can take those skills to other, other disciplines, other jobs. Um, added value I've already touched on. One thing that we stressed right towards the end, and I think it's possibly one of the most important things, is how do we demonstrate public benefit? Um, and, I still have forgotten it. Alice is doing a PhD on these things pointed out um, that we need to we need to evaluate public benefit. So if we do write it into WSIs and briefs, we need to have a mechanism to actually feed it back so that we can demonstrate to clients that we've done the public benefit. 
if we've written it into our aims and objectives, then we ought to be able to feed that back just as we you know, feed back on our aims and objectives about whether or not it was a Roman site or a prehistoric site. Um, and then there was a conversation about who does that. If it's a planning uh, condition, then presumably it's county archaeologists, and the other table already stressed how um, overstretched they are. On a project like HS2, it would be the, the client organisation that, that would monitor that compliance. But if we can't measure what we're doing, then um, we, can't, we can't demonstrate all these many wonderful things that we think we do back into the, to the wider world. <laughs> we were looking at developing a super policy on public archaeology. And our key three things really were that, uh, first of all, that CIFA's role in this was to create an environment. So effectively, it was, uh, its job was to set the tone and incubate interest and encourage local engagement effectively. But actually, a lot of the enabling came down to others, including local authorities. Um, so that was a kind of a fundamental starting point. It led us on to talking about whether or not um, there should be um, a development of the CIFA policy statement. Um, and I think, although there were mixed feelings about this, there seemed to be two elements which, which did need some review. First, that um, in, it currently means extremely bottom up, uh, top down, and it needs to be developed into being more bottom up, um, as in if it is going to engage and talk to the um, community. But it does actually have two purposes in that also it needs to go through the development led process and set standards and such like. So there's kind of a two-pronged issue there which needs to be developed. And then finally, um, we just looked at, um, as a our third key point really, about engaging, see for engaging um, more directly with volunteers. And it was felt that the best way of doing this was ideally through regions rather than national, and particularly in England, there are particular issues around um, the mixedness of the national network as it stands at the moment. Um, and that wasn't really the case in perhaps Wales and Scotland. Um, but there were some suggestions that the PAS, the Political Antiquities Scheme Officers, or a model like that might actually be very useful, um, at least as a starting point, or to develop something akin to that in England, whereas that wouldn't work effectively in some of the other nations. So that was our... The same question about the CEFA policy. And I think we had, again, similarly varied discussion, actually in varied points of view, um, but probably came to the conclusion that the, the, the policy as it stands at the moment has had its day, that it's very much of its time, um, and that it needs replacing, and that there's scope that to work more closely with CBA and with Archaeology Scotland on something that's a little bit more, a little bit more thoughtful about public archaeology and community archaeology, public benefit, um, that addresses the interface between community and commercial archaeology but also looks at, at the broader the broader scope of community archaeology.